Have a seat, Oliver. Uh, my pleasure. So, how did, how did it feel seeing bits and pieces of this version on this side of the screen? Tremendous relief. Uh, a march back, I suppose, you know, to say that there's more than one version of Alexander. It's a mountain for me, and, you know, you make a north face, and it was really fast to get up. We had to seven months to do it, and I'm, we did it. We got to the top, from my, at least in my point of view. It was precipitous and steep and icy, and that was a north face. And then we had three more months through DVD because Warner Brothers wanted, was interested in another version. And I was able to continue the seven months of uh, editing directly. You know, it was, a, for me, an intellectual as well as emotional journey. And I got to know him better. Ten months is, 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 you know, some people will prefer seven months version, and other people would prefer the ten month version. And I, I'm not able to judge uh, because I've been, but I, I felt that there was a progression of thought and clarity in the, tenth, in the ten month version. And I was really happy to get it out. I don't care if it's on film or on, but I really, DVD is the right medium to, to alternate and to play. So here we are. You know, this is one print that they struck mm -hmm. from the DVD. It's the only print in the world of this. So uh, here we are. Uh, actually, I'm told Warner Brothers has, has struck two prints. This one may go into limited circulation, the others for archival purposes, but it's still, for all practical purposes, a one-of-a-kind print, which is a yeah. pretty special thing. For museums and stuff. Exactly. So as far as, as far as the, um, as far as the process of creating this director's cut, um, when you went into doing what you're now referring to as the 10-month cut, how, how clear were you going into it, what changes that you wanted to make, and how much of the changes that you made just came as a result of the creative process? Well, you know, I think uh, I had the benefit, the luxury, of being able to see the movie open, see reactions in the world. I went all over the world from the east to the west, uh, to Eastern Europe, to Asia, to the Africa, to northern Sweden. I mean, I saw the film under so many circumstances, England, France, etc., and then uh, Japan. And it's really interesting to go around the world with one movie like this and get all this uh, very interesting, you know, how, what is the collective reaction? How many people agree? And, Certain types of people like it this way, and certain people don't. And it's just the world is a smaller place in some ways because we all feed off somewhat similar information. And uh, I got the ability to come back, and America too. And my and I just we kept working on it, working on. It. We had reactions, you know. Well, but that's not to say you have to react to the reactions. You right. have to find your own balance. And it was this investigation going on because Alexander's life to me is very complicated. I'm sorry to jump ahead. I was just going to analyze one thing, but I'll, I'll wait if you want. Well, what, I, what, I, what I'm curious about is the differences in reaction from country to country. Oh, God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, Spain was huge through the roof. I guess there's a lot of horses, uh, plumes. Uh, <laughs> and I think that they appreciate ancient history in a sense because they are. There's a little bit something ancient in Spain in the, in the emotion. Uh, and also the... Well, you know, you go to Poland, it's the same thing, because they had a big cavalry, too. It is a horse movie in many, in many ways. But also, Russia was huge. Russia was amazing. It was probably one of the biggest Western films in Russia in recent times. And, you know, the Russians see in this, perhaps, in the grand gestures and the operatic uh, structure, they, they see something that they like. So everyone's different. Germany uh, was very good. I would say Korea surprised everybody, because Korea is a completely different culture, and they knew a lot about Alexander. So there was all kinds of things, you know, that went on. France was different than England. England was terrible. Australia was terrible. I guess the English language countries were tough. Um, Why do you think that is? Well, probably because of the accents. I don't know. But it, it doesn't matter in Polish or Russian. Be more universal is what I think. You know, get away from... Well, I don't want to go to the accent issue because I, I don't agree with the criticism. I think it, Irish is absolutely correct as the English equivalent for uh, Macedonian to Greek. That was a deliberate choice on your part, was to have that Irish... I hope so. I paid the <laughs> price for it. <laughs> At least in America. But, you know, what do they want? The, Spartacus has guys talking in Brooklynese, you know. And, and, 
frankly, if they'd been if they'd been tough, they would have got nailed them on that. But it was good. It worked. You know, I bought Kurt Douglas and Tony Curtis, and you know, and Olivier and, and Lawton were the uh, upper class of Rome. So I mean, whatever conceit you have, I hope it's as long as it works, right? Great. So, what were some of your influences when in crafting this? How well? Let me let me start actually by how long ago did you start? Did you make the decision? I want to make a movie about Alexander the Great. Oh, uh, it came up in 1989. A German producer made it real. He said, "Like let's let's do it." And he had a plan. It didn't work, but we eventually got it made ten years later with another German producer, two German producers, and they got the money together through. French and English subsidies, as well as uh, German and Korean, and uh, finally American. And so it was a tough place to put together, very independent production. Uh, 1989, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talked about it a little bit with Conan, uh, with, with, with Arnold mm -hmm. in 1979. <laughs> yeah, serious, it was sort of around, and I knew uh, but it was really with Val Kilmer of The Doors that we first really th sparked to the idea of getting it done. And also with, the, uh, uh, with Tom Cruise in 1995, we had another sort of spasm where, but we never got the scripts right in either case, ever. So it wasn't until 19, 2000 area, 2001, that the momentum got right. And Gladiator helped us enormously because it was so successful. Mm -hmm. um, so how many, how many versions? You've got three credited writers, yourself and two others. At what point did those other writers come into the process? It's a long story. I don't know if you want to go. That's a Writers Guild issue. But uh, <laughs> 95 was one, and 2001 was the other. Now, did they rewrite you, or did, did you hire them to write this? How they started. They... No, I, I started them off. We supervised, and we worked, they worked both very hard, very hard, many versions. But it didn't get made, you know. It's one of those things. It's a very complicated script, perhaps too complicated. You know, you've seen it twice now. Right, I've watched you know. both versions of it. Well, for example, in the director's cut, a big issue, and it was where do you, uh, the backstory with the mother and the father is fascinating. In the original theatrical cut, uh, the, uh, some of those scenes are moved uh, to the front, in front of the Battle of Guag uh, Guatemala. I was going to say Guatemala. I mean, Gal Gamal. <laughs> but uh, so uh, the character of, of uh, Colin is introduced as a young man who's soft with his mother and defiant with his father. So you see him. But in the new version you saw tonight, it went from the cave with the young man right to the battle. It was a transition. Father had been killed. Time had passed. Ptolemy was controlling the story. He was telling it the way he wanted to tell it. So in that scene, you don't find out what happened, but you understand what happened because after the battle, something strange happens. If you look closely, he goes back to the cave. We go back to the cave, which we didn't do in the original. And we, go, we told the rest of that story that the father said about the myths. And he talked about the titans. And it's important because the titans is what Alexander refers to at the altar scene, which is also new at the end. Tell him titans were here. Uh, Alexander had, I think, recognized that the titan, what it, the father says is the titans, the ashes of the titans were put with, more, with were mixed with mortal men by Zeus, and uh, giving birth to this flawed human being that was all of us, that was Alexander too. And I think he recognized that, and I think there was a bestiality. And the father and the son, philosophy in the cave is great because the, the father is talking about the bestiality of man, and the son is talking about the idealization of man. He said, one day I'll be on, on, on walls like these. And then we cut to Babylon, and indeed he did become the young man who dreamed so passionately and so vividly that he became this larger-than-life creation that has existed for centuries, passed on by people who obviously appreciated him. What is it about Alexander that fascinates you so much? What, what drew you to this historical character and this, this saga? I think it's a better story than Christ. <laughs> OK, why? No, it's just a unique, I mean, think about it. This guy at the beginning of time reads all these stories about Theseus and about Achilles and Perseus. and. 
uh, Jason and all the Eastern, all the Greek heroes who go to, and Hercules, Heracles and Dionysus, they all go east. That's it. It's, a, it's like what you grow up with, you know. It's like, I guess, an American grows up with, we'll go kick ass in Vietnam or whatever. But uh, here they go east and they find, uh, they all take back from the east to the west. They carry back the loot, the, the Jason the, takes back Medea, the Golden Fleece. Heracles takes back the Amazon queen. But here is Alexander. He doesn't come back. He stays in the east. And this is, orig this is history. This is not myth. He stays in the east, and he becomes eastern, so much so that he provokes his own army to, I believe, to, to question him and finally to, to kill him. So it, it, it's unlike any, any imperialist story. He, did, he was not interested in stealing the resources of the east. He was interested in making one, in my opinion, one empire, like the modern United Nations, but with no nation states. They would all be satrapies and whatever. Of course, he would be the head of it. And if, I mean, if you go back to the origins of time, why couldn't it work? Why couldn't the nations of the world be? I mean, they weren't nations. What if there were tribes fighting in Persia, tribes fighting in Greece? The Greeks didn't, didn't succeed, whatever your history teachers tell you. They had a little period there, but then they all started fighting among themselves. The city-states, war after war, the Peloponnesian War. It's over. The Greeks don't work. It's Philip and Alexander together who really bring back the idea of a, of a Hellenic culture that works and spread it all over the world. And Alexander, what I love about him is he knew no bounds. He, had no, he was Icarus. He knew no limits. His belief was that it could work. He would go on. He'd take everything he could in India, combine it, and then go west to Saudi Arabia, Spain, as he says in the movie. And you know, for all we know, it worked for 11 years because there were very few revolts behind Alexander. He succeeded. Wherever he traveled, there was peace in his wake. If anyone broke the treaty with Alexander, he went back and he basically was, was ruthless with them. Uh, and, but that set the tonality and there were very few rev revolts in that whole era. I mean, it goes to say that if you make a treaty, you enforce it, which has not been the case in, modern, in the modern diplomacy where all the treaties seem to get broken. I mean, he really, it was, he stuck to it. Uh, he's an amazing, so the, in other words, what I'm saying to you, although war, and he killed people, and people were killed, and so forth, but they'd always been killed in tribal warfare, at the end of his, his killing, there was peace. And not only that, prosperity, culture was passed, Greek went east, east went to Greece, and of course, the Roman Empire took a version of Alexander's empire, basically, and, and, and used it, but they used it for different purposes in Alexander. They really... Uh, it changed. I don't want to go into that argument, but it, it becomes much more militaristic with the Romans than with the Greeks. So for modern audiences, what does the story of Alexander, what lessons are there for modern audiences in Alexander's story, especially your vision of Alexander's story? You know, I, I think it's getting out of our culture. I think our culture drove me crazy. I mean, between natural born killers, JFK, all the attacks, and Nixon. I've said a lot about our culture, and I, and I kind of felt like at that time, there was a dead end when Bush came in. It was just not really, I didn't want to be around, so I wanted to, to move on into the past, and I didn't think about it. it there, Bush is a revisionist story because it's ironic that, of course, that he went to Iraq at the same time. I mean, he invaded Iraq with a like, like Alexander invaded Persia, but Alexander succeeded because he pursued